Good day, Grade 12s. Uh, welcome to Lesson 60 from my textbook, The Distinction Bound Student. We have Grade 12, Grade 11, and Grade 10. Right, in this lesson, um, I gave you homework in the previous lesson. So it says name and discuss at least four criteria. Now, in an exam, you won't find such a question. They will probably give you a specific criteria like discuss nature of product and collusion as, class, as a way of classifying markets. All right, so that's why I gave you this. But now, when you did it as homework, it was very easy because you sort of had the answers from the lesson because we were discussing this in the previous lesson and you'll see in the textbook, it's the same thing that you find it. So you might find this, um, this homework uh, maybe useless or pointless, but it's not really pointless because it's a possible question in an exam. And in an exam, such a question will be eight marks. All right. So they'll probably give you two or one. And then with that one, you'll have to come up with four points. All right. So let's get down to the next question. It says, is collusion possible in a perfectly competitive market? And the answer is, collusion is impossible because there are so many firms in that market structure, okay? So they cannot collude. All right, so let's go now to a perfectly competitive market and see what are the characteristics. Right, a perfectly competitive market is that market structure where there are many firms that are selling a homogeneous product. A good example will be uh, a, maize, uh, a maize farmer. A maize farmer is an, a firm that is in a perfectly competitive market. All right. So the industry is all the maize farmers in the country and the individual firm is the business or the perfectly competitive firm. All right. So what are the characteristics in that one? Number one, let's look at number of firms. How many farmers are in South Africa? The answer is obvious. They are many, okay? There are many farmers in South Africa. There are many apple farmers. There are many maize farmers. There are many anything else, okay? How many farmers are uh, involved with uh, maybe sheep? There are many. So you see that uh, they are in one industry. So that's it. Number two, would you find a farmer that tries to distinguish his maize, that tries to distinguish his sheep? And the answer is no. Sheep is sheep. You won't find farmer A's sheep, uh, the, 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 the way they, maybe what they eat, uh, they'll eat the same. They eat, they feed on grass or they feed on leaves. And so there's no way a farmer can try to differentiate his sheep because what sheep eat is what sheep eat and it doesn't matter who the farmer is. All right, so the product is homogeneous. That means it's standardized. The next one is freedom of entry. When can you start planting your own maize? And the answer is anytime. And when can you stop? The answer is anytime. So entry is absolutely free. Exit is absolutely free. The next one is collusion. Is it possible? for farmers to collude on the price of maize, for instance? And the answer is no. And I think you remember in, in the homework that I gave you, I asked, is it possible for a perfectly competitive uh, firm to collude with other firms? And the answer is no. And the reason is there are too many to collude. So it won't be possible. So in that kind of a market structure, price is merely determined by demand and supply. The next one is information. Information is complete in this market structure. Uh, we know exactly where to buy maize uh, seed so that we can go and plant our own maize as well. We know exactly when, we know the season, we know so we can go and plant and we know how to. And once we're done with that, we know where to sell it. So information is absolutely free. But if you look at other things like, uh, can you make a McDonald's burger? And the answer is no. 
because you don't even know the ingredients. So you see that in that kind of a market structure, information is incomplete. In South Africa, SAB uh, uh, makes Coke on behalf of the Coca-Cola company, but SAB does not know how to make Coke. How? Because they receive the Coke syrup and then they just mix it with whatever it is that they mix the ingredients but how that coke syrup is made they don't even know so they do it on behalf of the coca-cola company and apparently there are only a few people that know how to make that coke syrup in the world so those uh, i watched this other documentary by coca-cola and it said those people are not allowed to be on the same plane because if they all die then no one knows how to make coke anymore. So you see that information is incomplete. You don't really know how it's made. Uh, but in, in as far as a perfectly competitive market is concerned, information is complete. So we know exactly how things are done. The next one is control over price. There are many firms in this industry. So an individual firm, it becomes a price taker because he has no control over the price. So price is determined by demand and supply and as a firm, you just take that market price. You don't like the market price, exit the industry. It's as easy as that. Right, the demand curve. I mentioned that. So the demand curve in a perfectly competitive market is horizontal. Okay, so this is what we mean by that. Right, let's move on to the next thing. And, and in the next lesson, I'm going to explain why it is horizontal. The next one is uh, economic profit. Okay, a firm in a, in a perfectly competitive market. Okay, I'll, I'll explain it in future, but in this case, I'm going to do it very fast. All right, so we have demand, we have supply. So this is the industry, the whole industry. And these two, Market forces, they tell us the quantity, they tell us the price. So we are price takers. Now let's assume we are in this kind of a situation, MC, D is equal to AR, whatever, and we are in this type of a situation. I'll do it just fast. You may not understand what I'm doing right now, but um, I'll explain. Okay, so in this kind of a market structure, this is what we call an economic profit. So this attracts firms into the industry and because of this firms enter and when they enter look at what happens supply increases so when this supply increases we see what happens price goes down you see supply increases to Q1 so when price goes down this becomes our new demand curve which is equal to whatever so this kind of a situation price goes down is what we call normal Profit. So this is what happens in the long run and the firm cannot make economic profit in the long run because of that. Alright, moving on. The next one is um, decision making. If farmer A decides on not planting this year, it doesn't affect the industry because farmer, farmer A is just a drop in an ocean. So whatever it decides on doing or not doing, it doesn't affect the industry. But look at an industry where there are only four firms or five. Let's say if MTN decides on this, that will definitely affect Celsi, Vodacom, and so on. All right, the next one is uh, a perfectly competitive firm can, uh, can uh, achieve productive efficiency. That means it can produce goods at the lowest possible price. The last one is firms in a perfectly competitive market can achieve allocative efficiency. All right, so I think we have reached the end of the lesson, examples I gave you, and um, let's see. With reference to the number of buyers and sellers in perfectly competitive markets, explain whether market power exists. So this question is asking, do you think firms have market power in this market structure? Number two, is the JFC an example of a perfectly competitive market? Motivate your answer. Alright, I'll see you in the next lesson and that will be lesson number 61. Enjoy your day.